Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Latin American webinar for physics, number 124. It is a pleasure for us to have today Professor Jesse Shelton. Uh, Professor Shelton uh, got her PhD at the, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And after that, she was a postdoc at Rutgers, Yale, and Harvard Universities. And today, um, currently, she is an associate professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. We are very happy to have her here today to talk to us about non-standard thermal histories and the small-scale uh, matter power spectrum. Thank you very much for joining us, Jesse. Before uh, you start, I want to remind everyone that you are very welcome to post your questions on the chat of YouTube. Please, if you write your questions there, we will be happy to read these questions to Jesse after, the, after she has done her presentation. Uh, please participate and let us know your comments and questions. Thank you, Jesse, again, and you can take it away. All right, thank you very much, Walter. It's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> Slide sharing is again doing something unexpected. Give me a second to find. We tested this. Um, interesting. Keynote is crashing. No worries. In the meantime, we can say like, stay tuned for the next season, which is going to start in January. We have a lineup, again, quite interesting uh, speakers. You can follow us on YouTube and social media. Oh, I, I made it. I make this commercial. Okay. <laughs> right, thank <laughs> Take you it away. Much. Uh, so today, yes, I'm going to talk about non-scale, non-standard thermal histories and the small-scale matter power spectrum. So usually when people start a you know, particle cosmology talk, they will show some version of this slide. I'll say you know, we have lots of independent lines of evidence to understand uh, you know, the existence of dark matter, uh, starting from uh, cosmic microwave background through the evolution of uh, structure on large scales, meaning you know, galaxy clusters, galaxies, and so on, growth through time. And at late time, of course, we have evidence for the existence of something that sources uh, the gravitational interactions without uh, tracking uh, the baryons that we can see. Of course, historically, uh, one of the first lines of evidence was uh, galaxy rotation curves, which uh, show a bigger gravitational potential and can be explained from visible matter. And of course, recently and rather dramatically, lensing evidence from the bullet cluster that shows there's more mass than baryons and physically displaced. But I am going to be very interested in the matter power spectrum and uh, what it can say about the history of our universe on the moments of time that are you know, buried in this mysterious white glow here. Um, back at this very early time, we don't have pretty pictures, we have, you know, mental cartoons. What do we know about the very early universe? We know some things. We know that there uh, was the standard model in the early universe, and we know that it was there and in thermal equilibrium, uh, definitely at the formation time of the CNB. And then our earliest evidence about the ingredients in our universe comes from big bang nucleosynthesis at temperatures of order and MeV. We also know from the CMB that there had to be some form of dark matter, and it was new, cold, limited interactions both with us and with itself. Um, and uh, then we also know that there has to be some period of inflation or something that you know, is, you know, does its job uh, that gives rise to the fundamental uh, perturbations, the primordial perturbations that grow into the large scale structure that we see. Uh, now, this is you know, earlier than an MEV. This is very poorly constrained and very poorly understood. So we know that Big Bang nucleosynthesis tells us what the universe looks like up to order you know, 10 MEV. So this is our cartoon for the expansion history of our universe. So we parameterize the expansion history of the universe with a scale factor, little a. This is the you know, energy density. At late times, you know, roughly the formation of the CMB on 
to us. I'm not going to talk about cosmological constant. Um, I'm interested in very early times. We, uh, the universe was dominated by matter, uh, dark matter as well as us. Uh, and then at times prior to recombination, uh, the universe was in radiation domination. We know that happened all the way up to BBN. And then we don't really know what happened before BBN, but we figure that there was some period of post-inflationary reheating uh, that let the universe transition from the inflationary phase into radiation domination. Standard, we don't know the scale. So standard cosmology, it just says, okay, you know, radiation domination all the way back to some reheating scale, which has to be early enough that BBN is fine, uh, you know, late enough that it's, you know, sub planckian because otherwise, you know, it doesn't make sense. Uh, but of course, this is you know, assuming that this goes all the way back for orders and orders of magnitude in temperature and therefore scale factor is a big assumption. We don't actually know that our universe did that. It's the minimal assumption. It's the assumption that follows from the ingredients that we know about. But there's a lot of other things that could have happened. And it's interesting to ask what could have happened and how would we know? And that's mostly what I'm going to talk about today. So early departures from radiation domination. So everything I'm talking about now is before BBM. Early departures from radiation domination can naturally arise in a variety of interesting, well-motivated theories uh, of physics beyond the standard model. Uh, historically, one of the first places people noticed this happening was uh, modulus domination. When you have a uh, massive scalar field, uh, when the universe uh, cools down to the point where uh, you know, the field notices that it's displaced from its potential, it will oscillate back and forth. That uh, behaves like matter, that coherently oscillating scalar field behaves like matter, and it can easily dominate the expansion of the universe until, it's, until it decays. Similarly, if you have a uh, you know, coherent scalar field, but instead of oscillating, it is uh, rotating rapidly in its potential, that is known as kination, and that can dominate. And then something else that I'm gonna talk about uh, today, which has uh, been noticed somewhat more recently than this variant and modulus domination, is suppose you have a hidden sector of fields, by which I mean a bunch of fields that are standard model singlets, um, interact with themselves enough to keep themselves in thermal equilibrium for some interesting part of time. Uh, but then in this talk, they're always going to be out of thermal equilibrium with the standard model. So the hidden sector will have its own temperature that is separate from the standard model temperature. So one idea you can have in mind is, this is a sort of minimal, non-minimal cosmology. You have some period of inflation and it ends with some reheating and the inflaton can decay, not just into standard model stuff, but also into hidden sector stuff. Hidden sector stuff will go on, you know, self-thermalize. It's very easy to make sure that uh, hidden sector you know, stays out of equilibrium with the standard model in this scenario. And I'm going to be you know, mentally imagining that dark matter is born out of the hidden sector radiation bath without direct involvement uh, from the standard model. That's not you know, something that has to be true about the universe, but A, it's very natural. Uh, B, it easily explains a lot of you know, null results <laughs> from standard model uh, experiments, like you know, direct detection, uh, collider production, and so on. Uh, and so this is the scenario that I'm mostly gonna have in mind. You can think about uh, this idea in part as a way to look for very secluded dark matter and to try to track the effects of these kinds of hidden sector dark matter models. And so the maximally pessimistic scenarios uh, where they're never in sort of interesting non-gravitational contact with the standard model. So if you have one of these hidden sectors, internally thermalized hidden sectors, this is a macroscopic amount of stuff in the early universe. Only part of this is going to go on and be dark matter in the same way that if you wanted to make a WIMP dark matter theory, right? And you know, WIMP dark matter is born out of the standard model radiation bath, but most of the energy during the radiation dominated period in the standard model radiation bath is carried by standard model radiation. In the same way, only a small fraction of the hidden sector's energy density in this cosmology is going to ultimately end up being dark matter. The rest of it is stored in hidden sector radiation. Now there's basically two possibilities. Either the lightest state in the hidden sector is light enough that it can go on and be dark radiation, in which case we can try to look for it gravitationally, or it's massive. If the lightest state in the hidden sector is massive, then once the universe expands enough that the temperature of the hidden sector is comparable to the mass of that state, 
then it redshifts like matter. But you have a thermal number abundance of it. This is enormous, and it can easily come to dominate the expansion of the universe. And in this case, you get matter domination. But because the microphysics of this early matter dominated era are different from the microphysics of this early matter dominated era, you can get some interesting things in this setup that you can't get in this setup. So if you do have a early matter dominated era, means you have a pre-Big Bang nucleosynthesis slowdown in the expansion rate of the universe. And that in turn is interesting because it gives matter a head start on clustering on very small scales. So first I'm gonna talk about head start on clustering, then I'm gonna talk about on very small scales. So here is a plot of the growth of a perturbation in dark matter. This is uh, delta, which is the you know, delta rho over rho, where rho is the energy density in dark matter at a given uh, wave number k, co-moving wave number. And then this is the scale factor again. So this shaded region is when this particular co-moving Fourier mode is outside the horizon. So nothing happens when it's outside the horizon. Once it enters the horizon, so once the uh, uh, Hubble you know, horizon has grown to the point that this mode fits inside the horizon. Uh, then it gets a you know, bump, a roughly an order of magnitude bump, uh, just you know, standard thing that happens when modes enter the horizon. And then during radiation domination, the standard solution for a mode undergoing linear evolution is logarithmic. So it grows, but very slowly, just logarithmically. So not much happens uh, until at late times in the standard cosmology, the universe becomes matter dominated. And then you get linear growth during matter domination. Again, standard result for a perturbation in uh, uh, linear evolution. So of course, linear growth gets you much stronger, much faster uh, enhancement in the density contrast than logarithmic domination, uh, logarithmic growth during radiation domination. So if you have an epoch of early matter domination before the standard uh, you know, matter domination starts, uh, then you have even a relatively brief interval of matter domination, you have a, you know, an epoch of linear growth for the perturbation, and that can give you a big enhancement over the standard cosmology because you know, linear growth is a lot faster than log growth. So this description is of course using linear theory. So you might be suspicious when I start talking about uh, perturbations that are ordered unity. And indeed, if you have a perturbation that uh, crosses the so-called uh, critical density collapse threshold, um, then that's when linear perturbation theory stops being a good guide to describe the physics of this mode. At this point, we say that uh, this cutoff, which is uh, in matter domination, the standard cosmology, about 1.686, um, at that point, uh, this mode uh, becomes you know, self-gravitating. It detaches from the Hubble flow. We say it forms a micro halo and that keeps, and uh, at that point, uh, yeah, this is, this is now the regime of nonlinear structure formation. We're talking about halos, locally bound gravitational structure. Uh, you can see that in fact, this mode is so strongly enhanced, it crosses the collapse threshold, uh, not during matter domination, but even earlier during radiation domination. In this case, um, the critical density is higher. It's partly because you know, the uh, universe is expanding faster. So you have to get more stuff in one place to get enough uh, uh, local gravitational potential to really ensure that collapse happens. Um, so we're mostly going to be talking about uh, things. When we start talking concretely about micro halos, we're going to be focusing on the more understood story of matter domination. Bottom line, and what I want to make sure everyone takes away from this uh, plot, if you have a uh, a period of early matter domination, you collapse much earlier than in the standard cosmology. Okay. All right, so what this uh, looks like now is a, this plot was for one specific uh, co-moving Fourier uh, wave number. 
Now I'm showing what happens uh, to a range of scales. What I'm plotting here as a function of the scale of the perturbation is uh, the uh, transfer function that happens uh, in this altered cosmology. So understand this as the relative change in the growth of a perturbation in reference to the standard cosmology. So how much more growth do you get in these scenarios, or sometimes less, than if you just had you know, standard lambda CDM from the beginning? So as I go up in K, I go to smaller and smaller scales, and that means I go sort of back in time in terms of modes that entered the horizon earlier and earlier, and therefore saw more of the altered cosmology. So I start out with no change because these modes didn't enter early enough to see any altered cosmology. Then there's a time when you know, whatever was dominating the early universe you know, decayed, and so we could match back onto the standard radiation domination that we know we have to in order to get back EDM. This I'm going to call reheating. This is separate from uh, post-inflationary reheating. This is the you know, reheating that gets us from our uh, early matter-dominated era into standard uh, radiation-dominated uh, physics. So modes that entered before reheating saw some of the radiation, saw some of the departure from radiation domination, it means they saw more growth. The earlier they entered, the more growth they got. And so this you get a characteristic rise in how much growth you got that uh, scales like k to the fourth, uh, which you can get by understanding how the horizon is growing, uh, as well as the duration of time uh, that modes spend inside the horizon. But this doesn't go on indefinitely. Ultimately, something cuts this off. And this cutoff is sensitive to dark microphysics, with the specific physics of whatever you know, thing is dominating the universe at this time will tell you the shape of this cutoff and uh, what wave number cuts it off. In other words, location of this cutoff. And this cutoff is particularly interesting in these models with you know, modified uh, expansion history in small scales. Because as you can see, this ends up telling you which scales are going to see the most growth and therefore will dominate the you know, ultimate clumpiness of matter on, on, uh, uh, on, on very small scales following the collapse of these perturbations into gravitationally bound structures. So understanding what this cutoff is, is super important in these uh, models with enhanced growth on small scales. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, some fun stuff about uh, you know, developing more ideas for what kinds of cutoffs we can see and then talk about uh, how we can test them. Uh, so there are a couple cutoffs that show up uh, from you know, standard uh, early matter dominated histories uh, that are new for early matter domination with relic dark radiation bats and you can't get in models with uh, moduli domination. So the uh, tight coupling to a, a relativistic species cuts you off at the gene scale of the relativistic species. That is actually what's cutting you off here. Uh, the, uh, there's also the possibility that uh, some of this nice uh, uh, early growth is cut off at late times because dark matter has too much kinetic energy and wanders out of the over densities and washes them out. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about today is a uh, cutoff that you get when you have interesting self interactions among the particles themselves making up the thermal bath, uh, even after they become non relativistic. Um, so, the other thing I want to say before we get started on that is to give ourselves a reality check about exactly what kinds of scales we're talking about. Um, this is going to let us uh, make a map between the uh, wave numbers that we're talking about and the resulting physical size of the uh, in, you know, potentially enhanced uh, dark matter density fluctuations in the late universe. So if a mode enters the horizon right at the transition out of this early matter dominated era and into a uh, radiation dominated era, well, by definition, that means the co-moving wave number is equal to product of A times H, where H is of course Hubble at reheating, and uh, trading A's for temperatures, that tells us that the mode, the scale of 
where we start to expect modified uh, structure, you know, modified number counts, scales linearly with the reheating temperature. So bigger reheating temperatures mean bigger caves and therefore smaller scales. I can convert a temperature or a wave number to a you know, mass, you know, how much mass is contained in the resulting halo uh, that forms from perturbations on that scale uh, by saying, okay, you know, here's K. Um, I construct a sphere uh, corresponding to the physical size of a mode with that wave number, take all the mass inside that, and that gives you something uh, related uh, to the uh, density of dark matter like so. Plug in numbers and you find Given what we know from Big Bang nucleosynthesis about the smallest acceptable reheat temperature, again, we have to map back on to the uh, physical cosmology that BBN tells us we have to have at late times. Um, we're talking about enhancements to halo populations on scales that are smaller than the Earth mass. So they're very small. This is a very different regime from the kinds of uh, small scale structure that uh, people talk about uh, in our galaxy, which is something like 10 to the six and to the seven solar masses. So we're talking uh, micro halos. So now let's talk about uh, this microphysics and the small scale cutout. Uh, Something that is very amusing to consider is the case where your relic dark radiation bath doesn't behave like you know, the standard model radiation bath. Um, it behaves uh, in a way that is only possible for a hidden sector that is thermally decoupled from the standard model. This is the case where the lightest state in the hidden sector becomes non-relativistic, but it still has uh, interactions, self-interactions that can keep it in full thermal equilibrium, meaning chemical equilibrium, as well as kinetic equilibrium. This means it has to have number changing self interactions that let its uh, you know, phase space distribution function track the you know, thermal equilibrium distribution as the temperature decreases when the universe expands. So this sounds exotic, but that's just because particles in the standard model this doesn't need to happen. Everything in the standard model is in equilibrium with you know, the relativistic photons. And so there's no time for any epoch of this form to happen. Very simple field theories give you uh, this kind of behavior. Uh, in particular, the simple you know, phi to the fourth uh, theory exhibits cannibalism. This is everyone's favorite you know, basic example model. Um, here are in the, so this is a case where I have not assumed a Z2 symmetry. We have uh, therefore three to two interactions. These are just a couple of the Feynman diagrams. You have three particles in the initial state. They go to two particles in the final state. Um, phi to the fourth theory is also of interest because it is a good toy model for um, hidden glue balls. So if you imagine that you have a hidden sector where the, you know, where you have a non-abelian gauge group that you know, confines at the bottom of your chain. This is a reasonably good toy model to describe this you know, perhaps more theoretically appealing uh, uh, hidden sector. Um, so if you look at what's going on in these interactions, they let you trade rest mass for kinetic energy. And this is what lets the uh, cannibal you know, keep its number abundance tracking the equilibrium value. Um, I'm gonna parameterize the cross section for this to happen in terms of an effective coupling constant, uh, alpha C. Notice that this goes like uh, one on M to the fifth. All right, so the thing about cannibals is they cool down slowly, right? They're continuously converting, they're continuously converting their rest mass into kinetic energy and heating themselves up. So if you track what happens to a, this is a simple five to the fourth toy model, um, uh, radiation bath that is cooling down. It's made out of these things. It starts out relativistic. You know, we start our initial our simulations when the temperature is ten times the cannibal mass. It starts out behaving like radiation. You can see the energy density uh, times uh, a cubed is falling off like you'd expect for radiation. But then, as the temperature gets to be of order the cannibal mass, uh, the mass starts to become more and more important. Then here is a regime where we are using Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics to model a cannibal. 
And here it cools down very, very slowly. We have like three decades of uh, evolution here, but the temperature drops by only a factor of you know, few. Um, in fact, the energy density is falling off uh, logarithmically, therefore the temperature also evolves logarithmically with the expansion. But of course, this can't keep going indefinitely. You know, these reactions require three particles in the initial state. And so eventually they'll, you know, you'll run out of uh, cannibals to have this reaction happen efficiently uh, while the universe is expanding. And so they will freeze out. And after that, they evolve uh, just like matter. So it's hard to get more than you know, a few decades of cannibalism. It's relatively insensitive to both the mass and uh, it depends on alpha c to the, the two thirds power. So you can't get you know, too much of this uh, epic of cannibalism, um, but this has an interesting effect on the cosmology of what happens. So the Hubble rate is different from either radiation or matter. And this you know, in principle is important for understanding perturbation growth. Even more important though, is the fact that the difficulty of the cannibal fluid in cooling gives you pressure support in the fluid. So here we're showing the evolution of the sound speed and the equation of state with scale factor. Um, this is the equilibrium values. And then you can see, uh, so this is cooling down from the relativistic value to the cannibal value. And you can see this drops slowly. Um, and then, uh, after sudden freeze out, you see the equation of state starts deviating from the equilibrium prediction almost immediately, but the sound speed hangs on uh, relatively large for a factor of two-ish before it starts to drop. But here, you know, what we're showing is the difference between uh, the sound speed that you have in this cannibal model versus if you have the same sound speed at you know, late times, what you'd expect if it were radiation all the way down. And so you see, you know, it takes, Pardon, I misspoke. Uh, if you just take a non-relativistic matter and extrapolate how it uh, how its velocity uh, scales with scale factor, you get these lines. So you see, uh, took a cannibal many decades to get the same kind of cooling that you would expect from just dust. So following freeze out. Um, you can have a potentially substantial epoch of matter domination. This is controlled by a different combination of particle parameters. And then eventually the cannibal realizes it's unstable and decays. And then this is reheating and then uh, uh, cosmology marches on. So what happens to dark matter perturbations in this kind of cosmology? Well, here, what I'm showing in the top panel, this blue line indicates the horizon. So it starts out growing uh, like radiation, uh, you see Hubble slows down uh, once the cannibalism uh, becomes important, then it goes like matter uh, all the way up through reheating, at which point it goes back to uh, radiation uh, type growth. The other thing I'm plotting is the genes length. If you have a component of your universe that has you know, important uh, pressure, you can compute in terms of the sound speed and the equation of state a gene's length that separates growing modes from oscillating modes. So modes that are uh, smaller than the gene's length oscillate. Modes that are outside the gene's length can grow. So basically the gene's length is telling you where pressure support is important. So we've plotted here this, uh, uh, the growth perturbation for this particular co-moving wave number. So Let's focus on the red first because that's the cannibal. That's the thing that's dominating uh, the universe and therefore the thing that sources the gravitational potentials. Um, so you see it's flat outside the horizon. It enters, it gets that kick, and then it grows, but only up until it crosses the gene's horizon, at which point it turns around and it starts to oscillate. And it keeps oscillating. Um, even after freeze out, it stops oscillating because the sound speed is still high. Note that the genes horizon is growing a little bit even after freeze out. That's it because again, the speed of sound stays high for a bit after freeze out before it drops. So it keeps oscillating and it doesn't stop oscillating until you know, decades of expansion after freeze out because that's the time at which the genes horizon has finally decayed enough that this mode escapes the genes horizon and starts to grow. And then once it escapes the genes horizon, we're now deep in matter domination and it grows linearly with scale factor like you expect for matter domination. 
So dark matter in blue uh, is very subdominant. So it is seeing the gravitational potential generated by the cannibal. And so it's flat outside the horizon, gets its kick. And then, ah, the cannibal's oscillating. So that means there's no net source for the potentials and dark matter doesn't do anything. It just sits there. It's flat all the way up until the cannibal gravitational fields finally start being important, at which point dark matter falls into those fields and gets the linear growth that you expect from matter domination. Radiation, meanwhile, it oscillates a lot. It's basically just around for the ride. So made a couple assumptions. Um, first, that the dark matter and the cannibal are coupled only gravitationally. Second, that the cannibal species is always dominant. I'll come back and, if time permits, talk about relaxing those. But uh, before we do that, uh, let's take a look at what happens to other modes. So here, um, this blue line shows a mode that does very similar things to what we talked about uh, in the last slide. Uh, it enters the horizon, it gets stuck oscillating the gene's horizon and then escapes and grows. This mode in red uh, enters late enough that it never really sees the you know, sound speed part. It just, it enters the horizon and it grows. And that uh, is something you can see over here. It enters the horizon, gets a kick and it starts growing uh, linearly because as far as this mode is concerned, this isn't really mattered up era with no funny business. So the mode that gets the most growth in this theory is therefore the mode that enters the horizon early enough to get the longest period of growth, you know, it sees the most amount of deviation from the radiation dominated cosmology, but doesn't enter the sound horizon at any point because oscillations suppress growth. So that's this, uh, black mode here, you can see here, the cannibal uh, enters the horizon, starts to grow. It sees a little bit of impact from the uh, pressure, but never enough to actually make it oscillate, and then it grows. This mode experiences the maximum amount of growth. Modes that enter later don't get as much enhancement because they didn't have enough time. Modes that enter earlier uh, get trapped in the oscillatory phase before they have time to grow. And so that ends up giving us a transfer function, something again that encodes the different growth in this model uh, compared to Lambda CDM that has a you know, characteristic early matter dominated era type rise and then a peak where both the location and the slope of this peak are set by the microphysics of the scalar field. So the location of the peak Again, this corresponds to the physical mass of the microhalos that we expect in the late universe is directly related to the freeze out scale when the interactions froze out. The amount of enhancement is related to uh, how long the early matter dominated era following freeze out lasted. So how long in between freeze out and reheating. And you can make very nice, simple uh, estimates for those things in terms of the underlying Lagrangian parameters. So uh, in the interest of time, I will skip, I, I will only flash this and say, I spent this much time talking about it because it's fairly robust. It doesn't matter uh, whether the dark matter has big interactions with the cannibal species or not. You get essentially the same prediction for the things you can observe, namely the location of the peak and the height of the peak. Um, and I will skip this in the interest of time. Um, of course, you can't directly see transfer functions, right? What we see are, you know, micro halos. And so in order to say anything about whether or not we can observe enhanced structure formation on small scales, we have to have some way to go from the transfer function, which is linear, easily computable, to micro halos, which are nonlinear and not easily computable. So, the two most important things in this transfer function are the location of the peak, because that will set for us a characteristic scale, and the amplitude of the peak, because that sets the characteristic formation time. Um, the more growth you have, the faster you will reach the collapse threshold, and the earlier you will form gravitationally bound structures. 
that matters because the earlier you form, the denser you are. And the denser you are, the easier it is to A, survive, and B, uh, give potentially measurable uh, impact on uh, observables today. But to connect, so it's, it's not too hard to model the sort of primordial population of microhalos that form out of uh, a given transfer uh, function. Uh, but connecting the first forming microhalos to the microhalos that survive in our low redshift universe where we can make observations requires detailed modeling. Um, and uh, to go further, I'm going to have to make a bunch of sort of spherical cow assumptions to make some estimates. Uh, and you should understand that I have to say uh, with that caveat. So these statements I'm making are based on sort of a stick, pick, stick figure uh, idea of what the low redshift universe uh, microhalo population looks like. To make these estimates, uh, I am using a standard uh, semi-analytic model for how to get uh, microhalos out of a uh, linear uh, matter power spectrum known as the extended press sector formalism. Uh, it works uh, very well. Uh, on large scales where it's been tested. It has not really been validated on small scales. Uh, the, the sort of micro halo scales that I'm talking about, but uh, this is what we can do, so we're gonna do it. The first question you might ask is, okay, fine. You're talking about all these um, modifications to the matter power spectrum on extremely small scales, and that's all fine and good, but do they survive in galaxies? There's a lot going on on galaxies, a lot of stuff around that you know is, important on scales. Remember that we're talking about things that are smaller than an earth mass scale. Stellar encounters can rip these things apart. So we think that probably these microhalos survive in galaxies in the sense that uh, an order one fraction of these things are likely to survive uh, even after all of the effects of you know, stellar stripping, um, uh, merger uh, into big uh, halos and so on. However, the surviving fragments are likely to be tidally stripped. So the dense inner core survives, but the uh, less tightly bound outer skirts of the halo will be stripped away. And probably in the dense galactic bulge environments at the center of big galaxies like the Milky Way, uh, probably there are too many stellar encounters and uh, most of these things are likely to be uh, destroyed. So the early formation redshift is really critical in making these uh, statements. Uh, we find uh, we need the redshift of collapse to be bigger than about 250 uh, to survive in the Milky Way. It's an estimate uh, from, from this work. Um, this is backed up by studies uh, numerically in this uh, sort of particle dark matter early uh, matter dominated context by Delos. And people have done similar estimates for uh, axion mini clusters, which are uh, very similar objects. These are objects that are born around, uh, born at early redshift with order one density contrast. And so they have very similar uh, properties in terms of these gravitational questions. This plot is from work by uh, these people on uh, axion mini clusters. Um, and the scenario of interest for us is this, um, uh, dashed line that is green, that's the way to map their model into these uh, uh, mini clusters. And they're showing the survival probability as a function of uh, distance from the center of the Milky Way. And so we are here. And so, you know, their estimates uh, give, uh, you know, order one uh, surviving fraction, but you see it drops off as you go into the center of the galaxy. The other question is, sure, but how are you ever going to see these? And here my answer is, we can probably expect to see some of these things, but it's futuristic. And there are a couple of different uh, things that people have used to get a handle on uh, this sort of you know, extremely small scale structure. There's a, uh, a lot of work by uh, Catherine Zurek and collaborators on signals these things can make in pulsar timing arrays. Uh, there's a lot of work by Adrian Aritek and collaborators on uh, the gamma ray signal that you expect when dark matter has an interesting uh, annihilation cross-section 
to annihilate into stuff that ultimately makes standard model photons. Um, and then something that uh, I've worked on with uh, uh, my colleagues uh, has been signals of uh, lensing uh, of, an, of one star by an entire galaxy cluster. This is based on the work uh, by other people in the context of um, axion mini clusters, which again, have a lot of similar properties to these early forming microhalos. So this idea is that if you have a single star that is being lensed by an entire galaxy cluster, in the absence of you know, lumpy microstructure, you expect a uh, signal like a light curve. This is in the time domain. Um, the star will brighten uh, as it crosses uh, past X and then drop off. The signal of lumpy microstructure is jitter uh, because uh, you're sensitive to variations in the local surface density on you know, scales that are the right length scales to probe these kinds of microstructures. So we make an estimate in terms of the size of these halos relative to the sun mass. So again, we're talking about uh, for early matter domination, uh, you know, sub earth mass that's roughly here. Uh, and then you're also sensitive to how dense these things are. Earlier forming things are denser. Um, so the, uh, so my collaborators uh, based this uh, sensitivity on uh, Hubble observations of a couple stars that have undergone such lensing events and used sort of those characteristic uh, scales in making this estimate. The width of these bands corresponds to what fraction of dark matter is bound up in uh, these micro halos varying from 0.3 to, to 1. Um, so the, the, in order to say what kinds of halos we expect to see, um, we have to know, you know where the peak is, you know, how much enhancement you had, and then also you might wonder, well, how much does it matter, you know, the shape of the peak? So we uh, looked at that. You can see that varying the, the rise, um, gives you, you know, the, the shallower the rise, the longer a tail at larger masses. The varying of the peak fall slope um, tells you, you know, how much stuff you get on very small scales. So very sharp cutoffs, like uh, exponential Jeans-like cutoffs give you this, but cannibal-like cutoffs here give you a bigger plateau and so on. And so if you take one of these things and you run it through a you know, semi-analytic machine to get the uh, distribution of micro halos. Um, your one sigma density fluctuations give you a curve like this for this particular parameter point. This is a relatively low reheating temperature parameter point. And two sigma fluctuations give you something bigger. So the important thing, basically these are rarer uh, density fluctuations. Therefore you get more um, that A form earlier these dashed lines are telling you about the redshift of collapse. Again, the earlier you collapse, the denser you are, so the more interesting your signals. You have in any given random density field, uh, some fluctuations that are rare and will collapse earlier on bigger scales, which is why the rarer fluctuations give you a bigger uh, signal. One sigma, the sort of the, the things you normally expect and they, they land here. So this kind of scenario is potentially very interesting for uh, getting some handle on whether or not we have you know, fine grained structure in the, uh, in the uh, dark matter distribution. Um, here's a situation that gives you even more uh, structure on small scales, which is related to uh, things that I skipped for time and can go back and fill in uh, if there are questions. So the pulsar timing array story is somewhat more mature than this caustic microlensing uh, study. And so whether or not these preliminary estimates end up being representative of the ultimate realistic capability is still an open question. Uh, but 
uh, we think this is a very promising potential method to discuss uh, to discover uh, microstructure in uh, dark matter distributions, which would then say something interesting about the uh, you know potential evolution history of our universe before BBN. Um, although the ultimate sensitivity of this uh, at very small scales is limited by the requirement that uh, the jitters, the smaller scale uh, you go, the smaller and more compact the structures are, so the you know, faster a star will go through them and therefore they get uh, you know, unresolvable. And there's a finite resolution in these uh, time domain signals here. So let me flash the summary. Relic dark thermal bats can easily come to dominate the expansion of the universe before Big Bang nucleosynthesis. You get uh, early uh, departures from radiation domination that can potentially give you a uh, uh, handle on ways to look for dark matter that is born out of uh, stuff that never talked to the standard model in an interesting way, otherwise you know, almost inaccessible to experiment. Uh, I've had fun playing around with uh, really cannibal dominated eras where uh, you can really map very precisely the properties of the linear matter power spectrum to the parameters of the scalar field that is dominating the early universe. So uh, you can identify the mass, the self interaction strength, and the reheating temperature and map those to the key scales that control the astrophysics. And then using these uh, input, you know, small scale structure models, you can talk about uh, you know, trying to detect the resulting enhanced structure on uh, small scales in the late redshift universe today. A variety of observational prospects, pulsar timing, cluster caustic microlensing, and uh, annihilation into gamma rays. Um, this is the easiest, but it requires uh, non trivial. Uh, assumptions about what the particle physics can be. These are gravitational and therefore don't rely on uh, particular you know, particle properties of what the dark matter is you know, doing, whether or not it was a you know, thermal wimp in the hidden sector or not. Um, but observational prospects for gravitational observables are still somewhat futuristic, but they're interesting enough to merit further work. And there is a lot of further work that needs to be done in really solidifying the uh, description of the late universe signals that follows from given early universe physics. But this is a very interesting uh, and promising avenue for uh, pursuing the interface between uh, particle physics and early universe cosmology. And the ultimate hope is that we will get a new way to understand the evolution history of our universe uh, in the mysterious uh, epic in between inflation and Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Thank you very much for your attention. I will stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Jesse, for this very nice talk. A round of virtual applause for Jesse. And, and now we are open for questions. Nicolas. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you, Jesse, very, very nice talk. Um, I have a question. I think it was one of the, your first plot. You showed a ratio of the, the temperatures, and you have the this uh, increase and then uh, a big um, cutoff. I think it was the ratio of standard model temperature in the case where you have this non-standard cosmology compared to the case with a exactly that one. Oh, no, good. Next. Yeah. Or no, I think it was next plot or previous. Here. That one. Yeah, exactly. good. Not temperature. Not temperature. Transfer function. So relative change. Ah. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. I was looking. We, we don't have enough letters. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right. Any further question from here? Uh, I, I have a. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Gillen. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, nice talk, by the way. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is, what is the initial conditions you assume? Is this good, the, good. Uh, adiabatic yeah. initial conditions. Um, that is an excellent question. That is important. Um, so the 
secretly, what I have in mind is this scenario where I've got single field inflation that gives uh, rise to both uh, the radiation as well as uh, all the hidden sector stuff. That guarantees everything has you know, boring adiabatic initial conditions because there's just one uh, uh, field that sources all the uh, uh, energy density. But you could easily imagine that there could be you know, relative isocurvature um, between you know, the radiation and the hidden sector. Um, that's also interesting. And this is not something that we've studied uh, completely, but you can show that isocurvature modes don't grow as much subhorizon as uh, adiabatic modes. And therefore typically um, the most interesting scenarios from the point of view of observability uh, in gravitational observables from this clumpy distributions are from uh, the adiabatic, the simple adiabatic scenario. But it's a very interesting question um, and it is worth um, exploring further, you know, what happens when there's relative isocurvature, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was my interest too. Um, but so yeah. With, yeah. with the isocurvature, you could have larger um, initial power spectra, right? So you could have a larger amplitude and you, so you could produce more later. Yeah, you can. Uh, um, and in some cases that can offset the um, uh, that can compensate for the fact that subhorizon they don't tend to get as much growth. Um, right. So that is something that we looked at in uh, this paper. Although we considered only you know pure isocurvature, pure adiabatic, we didn't consider cases where uh, where there's a mix. Yeah. And also for the adiabatic case, I guess you extrapolate the Planck results. That's right. Yeah, that's right. We assumed a. Um, we assumed that there was a underlying, uh, you know, scale, you know, nearly scale invariant spectrum all the way up to these unprobed scales. And then, um, so in the case of, um, you know, early matter dominated cosmologies, you know, all the interesting stuff happens sort of as a consequence of sub and growth. Um, and so, yes, you know, assuming that you start out, you know, perturbations of order one part in 10 to the five is, you know, that's not a tested assumption. That's absolutely true. Bigger uh, initial density contrasts, of course, give you interesting stuff sooner, um, but then the story gets complicated, yeah. Um, we also considered in this paper, which I didn't really have time to get into, um, other scenarios where dark matter is sort of born within, with a peak in the power spectrum uh, as a function of how it's produced, mm -hmm. um, usually by inflationary, uh, you know, um, origin, um, those are then isocurvature scenarios. Um, but uh, that's probably something we should discuss offline. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting question. Um, I, I have another one if I yeah. can ask. Please. I'm curious about this, uh, how you use the pulsar timing arrays. Uh, oh, good, yeah. So, so I should say, this is, this is not my work. These are the experts. Um, uh, the idea here is that, um, you have your pulsar timing array and you're looking for, again, time domain signals. So you're sensitive to, um, there are a couple of different regimes. There's a stochastic regime, and then there's a single halo regime. So let's start with a single halo. So the idea is you have your pulsar and you have the earth and you have a micro halo that goes in between and that will give you a blip. Um, and then uh, depending on how concentrated and how massive your halo is, you may or may not be able to see the blip. Um, usually uh, for you know, relatively small things, the um, stochastic signal you get from a bunch of these blips is more interesting than the signal from any individual blip. Um, right, so this is different from uh, these pulsar timing arrays to detect gravitational waves, for example. The right, it's, be that's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. This is a different use. So um, this is a very nice set of papers that is more um, experimentally mature than this, uh, uh, proposal here. These are um, looking for um, micro halos in our Milky Way because that's where the pulsar time area is located, mm -hmm. which means we're talking about necessarily things that are um, survived the dense, busy Milky Way environment. Um, cluster caustic microlensing is sensitive to um, the dark matter distribution in a galaxy clusters. These are usually like in the cluster itself as opposed to any individual mm -hmm. galaxy. And therefore you get potentially things that are less tidally stripped. Um, but there has been nowhere near as much 
you know, detailed study of systematics in uh, this observable compared to these observables. However, you, know, you see very nice projections for these. Um, one of the questions uh, for how well these projections will actually be realized ultimately comes down to how many pulsars will we see for how long um, and with what control. Um, and you can make both optimistic and pessimistic assumptions about that and get a range of possibilities. But the most optimistic possibilities, which look you know, very attractive in the point of view of what you can see, are futuristic in the sense they require a lot of pulsars for a long time. Thank you. Any questions from you all? I, I have a very naive question. Uh, I mean, when, whenever I see peaks that, uh, that, that you generate in, in, in perturbations early in the universe, I always remember the formation of primordial black holes. Yeah. Uh, so I guess it, it, are we here like on a, a, a very different scale for K modes or, or this is restricted by this uh, bound that, you, that we mentioned from BBN that, uh, that uh, on, on the Richelieu temperature so that you have a very low very low masses. So basically, is there a, a region in the parameter space for this, for example, cannibal model where you can actually grow so fast or doing that uh, plenty so of time much. so that you... Yeah, for, for the same reason that, um, you know, standard dark matter uh, when it clusters doesn't, you know, easily form black holes. Um, so in the case of uh, cannibal models, right? We start out with a fairly featureless spectrum. So everything has to form through subhorizon evolution, um, which means, um, you know, usually when you collapse and form a gravitationally bound structure, um, you know, same reason that dark matter halos are elliptical uh, rather than disks, right? You have too much angular momentum, it's hard to shed. Um, same thing here, uh, just on smaller scales. Um, so, uh, since we're starting from you know, very small density contrast in, in the cannibal models and getting all this enhancement from subhorizon growth, you don't really expect a change in you know, black hole formation compared to standard cosmology. Right, and then uh, a, simple, a simple question in this cannibal models. So the assumption is that this number changing uh, uh, interactions, they are, or these processes that are like five to two or or sometimes four to two, they are the dominant processes in the, so there, there is no, there is no like a significant coupling, for example, between the cannibals and dark matter so that they oh, could good. be two to two processes or. Yeah, yeah, good, good. So yeah, so we've assumed for simplicity that dark matter is already frozen out. Um, so that was mostly an assumption that we did for, you know, to keep things simple because we didn't want to you know, do all this conflict, all this expensive uh, numerical integration, and then let you know the um, number of relative degrees of freedom change throughout this process. <laughs> um, so, just for simplicity, we said, "Look, we'll have dark matter freeze out, you know, you know, early enough that we don't need to deal with the varying G star." But that's really the only effect that's important here. Um, if you're talking about dark matter, you know, annihilating uh, with the uh, with the cannibal species. Um, if I wanted to use this, so, so there are two to two interactions between the cannibal particles that help make sure that the cannibals stay in kinetic equilibrium, even when they're not in thermal equilibrium. And we, we checked to make sure that uh, um, the loss of internal kinetic equilibrium isn't important uh, for setting the, you know, the, the cutoff. So it really is the, the cannibal self interactions that set the cutoff. Um, so if you want to take this you know, simplify to the fourth model and really promote it to a uh, cosmological history of what happens with say glue balls, then in addition to the you know, one cannibal species, uh, which is like the, the lightest glue ball, you also have like a bunch of other glue ball species uh, with similar masses. And so they will often have these kind of cannibal interactions too, but they have, you know, you, know, you have a whole bunch of them, they'll have masses that are like multiples of the confinement scale and they have different CP properties and some of them will freeze out and some of them will. And so that cosmology starts getting a bit more complicated, but sort of fundamentally, the things that are really important are um, 
for understanding the growth of structure, the, the genes length and uh, how that, and then the, the ultimate amount of uh, energy density, because that controls how long this goes on and then when they decay. Thank you very much. Any questions before we say bye to the audience? Yes, Roberto. Yes, I have a question for, for Jesse. First of all, very nice, the, the webinar is very, very interesting. So I was wondering, uh, to, well, the, the, the basic question for me, I mean, is, uh, is it co uh, compatible, the cannibal mechanism with, because as, as I far understood, it mainly work when your dark matter is already frozen out, kind of, yeah. wimp, <laughs> the, 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 just the product you show. But is it possible to embed it or have you explored this a scenario in which you have, for instance, a warm dark matter or a freezing dark matter? Kind of, because the, 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 the couplings are so different in those scenarios that I don't know if they yeah. it could be embedded also the, the same mechanism. Yeah, for sure. Um, so um, this might help uh, answer this question. So. This is again from, from, from the same paper. We were mostly interested in, in understanding what happens to dark matter density perturbations and not thinking so much about the model building. But if you can see this line here, these lines are telling you what part of this parameter space, this is the cannibal mass and the reheating temperature, what part of this is actually even compatible with having uh, WIMP dark matter at all. So there are parts of this parameter space where basically uh, you get so much, um, energy injection, or sorry, entropy uh, injection when the cannibal decays that you dilute the dark matter abundance so much that you would have to have you know, couplings you can't deal with in order to get like wind dark matter. And so, yeah, there are definitely parts of this parameter space you can, for cannibals where they're not consistent with any sort of you know, hidden sector wimp at all. Um, and so you'd have to have some other kind of model to get dark matter out there. Um, so our analysis applies without modifications, as long as that relic abundance is in place sort of at the beginning of the evolution. My guess is a lot of other scenarios will give you a fairly qualitatively similar uh, evolution, um, but with some, you know, more complicated, like varying G star, you know, and so on. Um, if you have some other mechanism, but yeah, I haven't thought too much about uh, the details, so. There could be fun stuff hiding in there. Yeah. So red bullet color code correspond to what? Oh, good. Um, uh, how much enhancement you get, the, the amplitude of the peak. Uh, something I didn't have time to get into is this region here, we stopped color coding this for more than a, a factor of 10 to the four, because at that point um, you collapse during the early matter dominated era itself, but then those halos are mostly destroyed after reheating. Uh, and so you get signals in this band, but not in, not in here. And here you have to look for other ways to get at these scenarios. Excellent. Thank you very much uh, for, for your uh, presence today, uh, to all of you who watched uh, on YouTube. And uh, thank you very much, Jesse, for, for this amazing talk. Uh, oh, it was you. great to have you. Yes, and to all of you. <laughs> To, uh, to all of you who, who watched the video, uh, remember that uh, we have an, an upcoming uh, webinar uh, two weeks from today on December 8th. Camilo Posada will be giving the webinar number 125. Uh, please join us in, or follow us uh, through the social uh, networks and, be and stay tuned for an uh, upcoming announcement. And uh, have a great day or night for everyone. Okay, and Roberto. Yeah, I forgot that I